Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join us today for another summer interview. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Alexander. Alexander, welcome. Hello. I feel welcome. Oh, good. Excellent. And you're doing well, I hope? Yeah, I am. Having a good summer. You? I'm doing well. That's good. Yep. Great summer here in Southern Ontario. Alex and mm. I go back to uh, the days at, uh, at school and we, I think we had Hebrew together. We did have Hebrew. Okay. I remember a mutual friend introduced me to you that he, he knew you online beforehand yeah. and I had known you online. That That's right. So, um. so we, we, we know each <laughs> other in person and online, but uh Brought, brought Alexander on today. We're going to be talking some more Protestant denominations, traditions, and just hopefully, again, as the theme is for these interviews, educating each other. This isn't a, a time for debate. So if you're watching at home, hoping for a throwdown between a Dutch reform guy and a Baptist, you can find that plenty of places online. This won't be the, uh, the, the video for that. We're going to let Alexander tell us a bit about his church tradition. He's going to share a bit about the history the theology, and then get into some of the realities of church life and that sort of stuff. But before we get into the Dutch reform tradition, Alexander, why don't you just introduce yourself brief briefly, who you are, what you're about, and then we could dive in. Sure. My name is Alexander Proudfoot. I'm a member of Zion United Reformed Church of Sheffield, Ontario. Mm -hmm. I've been a Christian for six years. Um, I am also at the moment an intern at Stratford Christian Reformed Church in Stratford, Ontario where I've been serving since May. Um, yeah, I'm, as I mentioned, I studied with Christian here, and I have plans to go to seminary after, uh, in the fall of 2022, to go to Mid-America Reform Seminary, to which I'm looking forward to quite a lot. My interests are theology, of course, uh, history, reading, things like that. Nice. Excellent. That That's fantastic. And as we mentioned already, we know each other well, and I will just say, Alexander, it's great to have you on. You're a bright guy, and we've had a lot of fantastic conversation. We had a lot of laughs, but a lot of deep conversations <laughs> online, got into some yeah. good theology and our studies, of course, with Hebrew and that kind of stuff. We've had a lot of conversations, so hopefully people will be let into that. If we we laugh a little, it's because we're good friends, but uh, we'll, we'll dive in now and get started. So, as, as you mentioned there with the names, you're part of the Reformed tradition. And to yep. sort of zoom in there, we'll often, commonly speaking, speak of the Dutch Reformed tradition to right. perhaps distinguish it. We'll talk more about the name later. But why don't you just tell us, I, I'm sure for a lot of people watching now, they might be familiar with the label Reformed and know that there are Reformed, specifically Reformed churches. But maybe take us back a bit in the history. Who are the Reformed, the Dutch Reformed? Where do they come from? Sure. Well, as there's different ways you could maybe cut up the name as it would be seem to be obvious the dutch reform tradition or originates in the netherlands where dutch people come from but broadly speaking it's a part of the continental reform mm -hmm. tradition beginning in switzerland with Ulrich swingley later john calvin and having spread from switzerland and central europe it made its way up into the netherlands where in the 1500s, there was already a Lutheran minority in a predominantly Catholic nation. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, um, the Lutherans in the Netherlands, which wasn't united at that time, quickly adopted the Reformed Confession, began to agree with Calvin and his successors in Geneva and the, the beginnings of the Reformed churches in England. And so in a way, the Dutch Reformed Church is not unique. It is a Reformed church of a specific ethnic background. On the other hand, it has its own set of confessions, its own set of controversies, and its own shared history that unites the churches. Now, I say churches because there's not one. In fact, there's no church you'll find in North America that I know of that would just say, we are the Dutch Reformed Church. There are many denominations, like there are many Presbyterians. Um, but we all share that same set of confessions, that same set of theology, same shared core convictions, and that same history. Nice. That that lays it out quite well. So why don't we just dig in a little bit there? I think perhaps if people were listening well, they'll pick up on where you started with while uh, we speak of the Dutch reform, because perhaps sure. that's a stream that went to the Netherlands. But yep. you mentioned there are some common roots there with uh, Calvin, you mentioned, and Zwingli. Yep. So maybe just uh 
broaden our picture a little bit. You said continental reformed churches, and there it sounds like a family. What what are some other churches perhaps outside of the Netherlands that would share this common faith or history? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, Switzerland, the the reformed churches you would find in Switzerland, beginning with Zwingli and Calvin, would be one. Um, another continental reformed church would be the churches in Germany, the reformed mm-hmm. churches that have since joined with the Lutherans in the evangelical state church, I believe right. they call it. There's also a large continental reformed church in Hungary, as well as in Transylvania and in Romania. Wow. Um, also well known, I'm sure many of your listeners might know the Huguenots or Huguenots. Yeah. They themselves were continental reformed people in France and Belgium and that area. Mm-hmm. And so these are the broader members of the broader tradition of the continental reformed churches. Nice. That that's very helpful. And as you say, I, I expect uh, in Hungary and Transylvania, people might not know that history as well. Maybe that's something we'll talk about in the future right. sometime. But uh, with France, the Huguenots, people, that's something we we might not know what we're what they're about, but that's helpful. They are part of this this reformed family with this shared history going back to the the Reformation and especially that, I guess, that nucleus in the Swiss uh, canton. Mm-hmm. So uh, you mentioned a, a key part, perhaps, of your continental Dutch Reformed identity is this concept of confessions. And that, that's right. something that people I know online, especially, they'll speak of the confessionally reformed. The confessions are a big deal. So why don't you just walk us through, you mentioned there's more than one. You, it's plural right. you mentioned. So, uh, and right. we've talked a little bit about this, but why don't you just share what documents are you speaking about and maybe where do they come from? Right. So if If Presbyterians have the Westminster Standards, which would be the Westminster Confession, larger and shorter catechisms, the Dutch Reformed tradition specifically would have what we would call the three forms of unity. And these would be the Belgic Confession, which would kind of be like the Westminster Confession, maybe the 1689 London Baptist, but our version, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. I have a copy on my desk right here. Oh, nice. I don't know if you can see it well. Yeah, that looks good. It's a small little copy put out by Banner of Truth. And we would have the Canons of Dort, which is, it's a confession. It has the same authority, uh, subordinate authority in the churches as the other two, but it deals more specifically with the Arminian controversy of the 1600s, which Mm. was primarily in the Netherlands. Right. So, and and that's a a pretty big controversy. So we'll we'll swing back to that in a moment, but maybe just a a bit more of a foundational question. I know for a lot of people listening, they'll they'll know what confessions are in general and what what they're supposed to do. But I know also for a lot of my listeners and perhaps people in more evangelical, American evangelical style Mm -hmm. churches today, and uh, perhaps speaking about my fellowship, we'll speak of statements of faith, which are about Mm -hmm. maybe 12 to sometimes 20 points about various doctrines but a confession it as you held up the heidelberg even though it's a smaller book it's still a book so maybe what distinguishes a confession or the heidelberg something along those lines from what you might find on a a baptist church's website statement of faith kind of thing like that sure so confessions are historical documents that the church has written like the creeds Mm -hmm. which i mean if you don't know what the creeds are that might not be helpful but statements that are written up by the churches in the light of controversy to sort of crystallize or formalize the doctrine of the churches. So if you want to use the statement of faith on most church websites as a comparison, they are longer, generally more exhaustive, um, and they're shared by many churches. And they sort of serve as a unifying statement of faith for an entire denomination or even an entire tradition right and that that's something if a baptist is watching this baptist as well have engaged with this alexander mentioned the the 1689 the second london so that that's perhaps something we share in the broader uh, uh i guess a protestant family here this this use of confessions historically speaking so right. Uh, Maybe moving on from there, these are longer documents, and you mentioned, and this is a good segue, that they're typically born out of controversy. Hey, we have a question, we're trying to figure it out, and then uh, crystallizing the truth or the response in light of that controversy. And you mentioned that uh, 
I, I believe it was uh, that final document in these three forms yep. of unity that the uh, canons of Dort, the yep. canons of Dort, they come out of controversy. And this is probably a good one for a lot of people watching or listening where we speak about Arminians, we speak about Calvinists, but it's in your tradition where these terms are actually part of the history directly speaking. So maybe right. just broad overview, we can have some resources down below if people want to dig okay. into the dates and all the names and history, but why don't you give us the, the bird's eye view of what it, what are the canons of Dort and, and what was that controversy about? Sure. So my memory serves me right. The Synod of Dortrecht or Synod or pronounced different ways. The mm -hmm. Synod of Dortrecht met in the city of Dortrecht in the Netherlands in 1617. And it was at that point where they drafted up um, the canons of Dortrecht. The reason for it and the occasion for it was um, most people know it as the Arminian controversy. Mm -hmm. They also have another name, the Remonstrance of the Netherlands. Great. Um, what happened was in the late 1500s, as reformed theology continued to develop, um, there was a controversy in the University of Leiden with one professor known as Jacob Arminius, which is where we would get the name Arminianism from. Makes sense. And he had a bit more of a deviant theology than maybe um, Calvin's successors in, this, in Switzerland, which really was sort of where the theology was being written at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was a controversy in the university because he was um, he was responsible for training up the new pastors and they of course would agree with him being taught by him and so the controversy spread all throughout the churches and it had to do with issues of predestination eternal salvation eternal security um, total depravity tulip i'm sure many of your listeners would know it as tulip yeah and so that was the point of contention then you had the five points of the remonstrance or the arminian five points and at the Synod of Dortrecht, which produced the Canons of Dort, uh, the Reformed churches produced the five points uh, mm -hmm. or the five articles. Most evangelicals might know them as TULIP, the five points of Calvinism, right. total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Mm -hmm. And so that controversy was mostly resolved um, in the early 1600s. And the Reformed churches recommitted themselves to Calvinism at that time. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's roughly the history of it all. Yeah, which is great. And that, that sort but, of invites... But it something. isn't just a Dutch Reformed thing. At the same right. council, uh, British delegates were present, Germans, uh, the French weren't. But all across the Reformed world, there were theologians from every country. Mm. That's good. And, and that's something I, I wanted to highlight as well that you mentioned where it really is this reformed identity was bringing together different people from perhaps different geographic regions. And that's something I think we still see to this day where we might have some certain lines that will draw, but it doesn't stop interaction and sometimes uh, incredible displays of perhaps unity or uh, shared direction and guidance, especially when uh, we, we have some Anglican friends who will often mention, hey, there were there were Yep. Anglican churchmen at these synods or bishops involved even. bishops even so and, and that that's another thing where the history is uh, deep and amazing and sometimes today we'll use the titles and not know this history and we'll use the names and that of course we've seen online it might lead to some frustration from others where people are quick to claim hey I'm a Calvinist I'm an Arminian and know nothing about where these terms come from and who they traditionally refer to. And perhaps that's a discussion we could have in the future, talking about uh, TULIP, where, what exactly that is, how it came right. about and how it fits into the denominational landscape today. But that maybe that's a panel or something in the future. So of course. Uh, from there, maybe let's just, before we swing, we talked a bit about the history and I'll speak to Alexander after. I'll get some resources for people who want to dig in more, but uh, maybe the bridge between the history into the theology. We'll talk a bit about general trends in a moment here, but if you were to just describe perhaps, I, I wouldn't know how to phrase this, but the tone of, I, I think the Belgic confession, that, that's the one that's similar to the 1689 and right. uh, the Westminster where that's, uh, so typically as I conceive of it, that's sort of the doctrinal kind of statement while the Heidelberg catechism, it's pastoral, it's really getting the that, that sort of doctrine applied kind of discussion, mm -hmm. but maybe as a bridge, the Belgic confession, what sorts of things would be covered 
in that kind of document? What doctrines are in there which now define your tradition today? Sure. So the Belgic Confession is a full-fledged confession of faith. And so it begins with creation and, um, sorry, it begins with the word of God, it begins with the doctrine of the word of God, how God reveals himself to us, and ends with the discussion of the last times of eschatology. So it right. tries to capture the main themes of Christian theology, what Christians think about. It's colored a lot by its author, Guido de Bray, who himself was a, a a pastor in belgium hence mm. the name belgian confession right. he was also a martyr um mm. persecuted all throughout his life he ended up dying for the faith um at the hands of the inquisition i believe mm. um its tone in the way it presents its theology is heartfelt um it covers the main themes as i mentioned but it does so in a way where if you're paying it close attention then you notice that there's the themes of persecution especially when it talks about the church. Right. Um, it's warm, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting and helpful where, again, these confessions don't arise in a vacuum. They're surrounded by history. And you pick, you pick up the Westminster, you'll get a flavor of what was going on in England at the time. Yeah. You pick up the, the 1689, you'll, you'll see what Baptists were going through and who they were working with. And it yeah. sounds the same with the Belgic, where you have that rich history, again, of not only... Uh, life in the midst of persecution, but also, as it sounds, a, a deep awareness of who the church is and where the, the church can be found, those sorts of things yeah. where uh, that, mm -hmm. that's on the mind at the time. So may, yeah. maybe, unless you have fur further comment on that, we can transition into general trends. Did you have anything more you wanted to say on the confessional document? Sure. I think it'd be worth uh, talking a bit more about the Heidelberg Catechism. Good, yes. It is by far the most well-known catechism i would mm -hmm. think um and i've heard um most people know question one um what is my only comfort in life and in death right that i'm not my own but belong body and soul both in life and death to my faithful savior jesus christ mm. and so on beautiful document and it covers everything it's a wonderful but something that stands out to him and i think the reason why so many christians the German reformed, the Dutch reformed, the Hungarian reformed, and many others um, use it. Even the new city catechism that was put out recently kind of copies a lot of it yeah. um, is because it presents everything with an I believe attitude. Mm. So it's not just, you know, people can be critical of the Westminster catechisms because they might sound a bit dry or a bit maybe academic, a bit distant. Right. You don't get that with the Heidelberg catechism. It's able to be taught to children well to adults as a warmth to it just like the belgic and I, I think it's generally well respected and well received by a lot of churches maybe even not necessarily reformed churches make mm. use of it wow yeah and and i could just add like at my church we use the why well, my brother and i introduced it for our our youth group the the new city catechism which yep. builds on it as you mentioned and uh, another point to say is that baptists uh, loved it so much they created their own version in yes. 1680 so yes, it, yes, and, yes. and it was a bit of a at that time yeah. that was pretty common but uh, i think it yeah it, it uh what what's the there there's some sort of phrase where it's uh imitation is the highest form of flattery, oh, flattery or something. Yeah. yeah so so there um, there you go the heidelberg definitely stands and it's definitely something that reaches beyond the specific reform tradition and i think that's a testament to the the quality and the thoughtfulness that went into that so th thank you for presenting that again i will highlight i will definitely have a link to that down below so people can read it and check that mm -hmm. check it out for themselves i think it's worth the time certainly mm -hmm. so maybe now transitioning to the general theology before moving into church life today. Uh, there, there's the confession, people can read it, people can get a sense of what's going on. But realistically speaking, just talking and chatting today, there are some general trends of continental or Dutch reform theology that if uh, someone were to ask, for example, I'm an evangelical Baptist, and I people who are watching this probably know what I'm about, what I believe in that mm -hmm. sort of thing. If you were to do a bit of a general comparison, what would be the major differences? And uh, I, I think we, we, we know what we share here. We, we mm -hmm. probably talk about all the time, those core Protestant doctrines of the solas, mm -hmm. and of course, the atonement and scripture and different things. But there are some critical differences, which 
aren't worth sugar coating or hiding away from that right. do keep us uh, divided. So why don't you just highlight what some of those might be so that people get an idea of why Baptists and Dutch Reformed aren't uh, in the same churches on a Sunday morning? Sure. Well, probably one of the more notable differences is that we baptize children mm -hmm. and we don't um, necessitate immersion as a mode of baptism. Right. Now, a lot of churches I know on request, they'll do it. Um, oh, I don't think there would be any objections, mm -hmm. but in the main, we do pouring or sprinkling, though pouring is more common, and we do that for children and for adults. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be, that would scare Baptists off, I think. I think, or, I think you're right. <laughs> now, Baptists are free, of course, to attend Dutch Reformed churches. Membership becomes tricky, though, mm -hmm. uh, as I would imagine the reverse is true. Definitely, yeah. Um, you, you are right. We fit in with broader evangelicalism in many ways. Mm -hmm. But, and the Dutch Reformed, as I mentioned, are part of the broader Reformed community. And so our closest... Our closest church would be the Presbyterian churches, and we would agree with them on most everything to the point where there are actually some denominations that have um, merged in foreign countries and thinking of places overseas um, where they're so similar that they actually can just merge naturally. Right. Um, maybe some distinctives theologically are more so differences of emphasis. Mm. Um Maybe a lot of your listeners might know the name Abraham Kuyper. Right. So he was a president of the Netherlands, but he was also um, a church leader. He led um, one of the secessions, one of the schisms in the Netherlands. And he was very big into concepts of Christian worldview um, and the idea of sphere sovereignty or kind of political theology, how politics and theology merge. And that's... Um, that's an issue of interest, I think, to a lot of Dutch Reformed people in North America and in the Netherlands and other places where there might be um, issues of politics, issues of culture. Um, I think as well, um, covenant theology is massive. Some Dutch Reformed church bodies in Canada and the U.S. emphasize it very much. Mm -hmm. um, the view on covenant theology might be a bit more diverse than Presbyterians. There might be different views there, but that sense of that being a guiding focus of how we think about the Christian life, how we think about the church, how we think about God and Christ and so on, that is a guiding laser, if you will. Right. And, and maybe if I could, I'll just pause you there. You and I, we, and of course, uh, this is a place where there's often a lot of discussion and perhaps debate. Covenant theology is something we've spoken about. It's an interest for both of us, but yep. unfortunately, it's not something I really brought on the channel yet. I hope to in the future. So why don't you just give us, again, the, the quick little succinct statement. What, what do you mean when you say covenant theology, which is a big emphasis for the, the Dutch Reformed? Sure. Um, succinctly, yeah. covenant theology is the idea broadly, that God deals with people through covenants. Mm -hmm. Covenants being this formal statement of commitment, statement of expectations. So God comes to um, Adam and Eve in the garden, and he promises to them, our first parents, that they will have life eternal, that they will dwell with God in the garden if they do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And they break the covenant. Going forward, God comes to Noah and makes promises to him, unconditional, that he will not destroy the earth again, that he will save him and his family. He comes to Abraham, promises to him salvation, salvation in the seed that is to come. Um, David, we can think more and more. And then we have the new covenant, which is really um, the essence of the old, but presented with Christ and more expressly and more clearly and more beautifully. and that's the way like that's covenant framework we read the bible through it not like a dispensationalist might read the bible with right. that as like a way to divide up the bible into different eras mm -hmm. but as a main thrust going through it all that we understand that we as god's people have been promised things by him and that we can back on them we can take them to the bank mm. um and likewise he also expects of us certain things and though we fail god's grace is greater
And so he forgives us all of our sins. Mm, that That's very helpful. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned where perhaps a, a classic place where there might be discussion or perhaps disagreement uh, in the Baptist world. There, there are mm. camps that are into covenant theology, but dispensationalism is perhaps that equivalent sort of system of looking at the Bible, organizing it, reading it, and seeing how we relate to what God has mm. said and is doing. So that that's helpful. And I know for a lot of people in my circles, there is there has been movement where dispensationalism is a bit more, people are wondering a bit more of whether they should hold it, how they should, but are perhaps exploring covenant theology. New covenant theology is big in Baptist circles. And mm -hmm. uh, our school, that was uh, a big yes. progressive covenantalism was a big discussion. And so, so again, that's a big topic, but the key th takeaway here is that for the Dutch Reformed, covenant theology is something that really is, is a distinctive feature and interest of theirs, perhaps while other traditions, branches, however we want to phrase it, will embrace it and hold it for the Dutch Reformed, that's something, hey, that, that that's something we like talking about yeah. the same way a Baptist might like talking about church membership a lot. And right. while we all practice it or do it, certain people are gravitating towards certain and, things. And different denominations will tend to pluck at different strings mm. and will really emphasize um, that as something in their identity or something that they care deeply about or something they won't compromise on, things like that. Right. Excellent. And, and that's helpful. I'm glad you also mentioned that that might be a place how you might easily distinguish quickly while the Dutch reform and the Presbyterians, perhaps very similar paths or origins in the grand scheme of things, but there are different emphases that while you'll, I understand you work together and we'll get to that in a moment, the denominations and stuff like that, but working together on a lot of places, but some places where there's still clearly two different traditions with different confessional documents and, and interests there. So that that's helpful. So before we get into your church life and you have a lot of experience in the church in, uh, I believe your six years and a lot going on there with ministry, we'll talk about that, but very briefly, so people get the landscape especially uh, it's nice we're two Canadians so we could talk a little bit more about the Canadian <laughs> landscape where that that's something we see online all the time when people are talking about denominations and happenings it's America right. America America but uh, we'll we'll talk about that in general but uh, maybe just when people say perhaps you meet someone on the street and they say oh I'm Dutch reformed what denomination might they be a part of what are some of the big names that uh hold to this tradition or come from it and of course like every other tradition there are going to be there's a sliding scale of how of uh perhaps progressive to orthodox however we want to label it without mm -hmm. uh, dig getting into the weeds but what are some of those denominations that will claim to be continental or dutch reformed sure so i should a little bit of history mm -hmm. um they're in canada right specifically yeah. well can well why don't we start in general perhaps which could sure. be more american and then sure. make sure to hit on canada for our listeners yeah. sure there are three waves of immigration from the netherlands to canada that okay. uh and the u.s that has happened mm -hmm. one was when the dutch still owned new york and that region of the u.s right the second was in the 18 the early 1800s which is where Michigan became so Dutch in that region of the U.S. And then the latest was in the 1950s and 60s, which mostly came to Canada, which is why there's so many Dutch people or people with Dutch last names um, in Ontario, especially this region of Ontario. Right. Um, and so in those areas, in Michigan, in, um, the, in B.C., in southwestern B.C., mm. in southwestern Ontario, um, that is where the Dutch reform tend to be. There's places in Iowa as well, little pockets everywhere, but in the main, that is where people are. Right. Um, denominationally, um, each of those waves tends to reflect a different denomination. Mm. Um, the first denomination, the original, if you will, right. uh, was, is the Reformed Church of America or the RCA for short. Mm. Now, um, they were connected with the state church back in the Netherlands. And so they're the old, old, old church. Um, as of now, they're the second largest. Um, they are the mainline church, if you will. They would generally be more at home with maybe the United Church of Canada or the Anglican Church of Canada, the Presbyterian Church of Canada, um, churches like that. 
So they've been around for a long time. In the 1800s, uh, there was a split with the second wave of immigrants um, that formed the Christian Reformed Church, mm. which is by far the largest uh, Dutch Reformed church body. I'm interning at a Christian Reformed church. Right. Um, when you meet someone who's Dutch Reformed, more often than not, they're going to be Christian Reformed or from a Christian Reformed background. Right. Um, now, I would say that they are moderate to liberal evangelical. Mm. They tend to probably be more at home with uh, maybe people in the Fellowship Baptists, um, right. your denomination or conference. Um, churches like that, what, that kind of straddled the line between the evangelical world and the mainline world. Yeah. They, they, as well as the RCA, would th have things like women in office. And the, currently they're discussing the question of homosexuality, homosexual marriage and such. Yeah. Um, beyond that, we have a lot of smaller churches that have different histories. There's the Protestant reform that started in the 1900s. They are very small and they, um, they stand for denying common grace, which is an interesting doctrine with its own history, fascinating history, interesting group of people. Yeah. There is the United Reformed Church, which is my denomination, which um, split from the Christian reforms in church in the 80s and 90s over the issue of women in office, creation, biblical inerrancy, things like that. Mm -hmm. There are the Free Reformed Church, which came out as a separate smaller immigration to Canada. Um, they would have more of a Puritan emphasis, if you will. There's right. the Heritage Reformed, which, and then the Netherlands Reformed, and the RCNA, and tons of other smaller groups that I don't think we need to get into, yeah. not because they're not important, but because there's a lot of history there. But in the main, when you meet a Dutch Reformed person, they're going to be coming from a Christian Reformed background in our part of Ontario. Yeah. The southwestern part, all the way from London to um, Mississauga to the Niagara Peninsula, hmm. I would say. Yeah. And, and that that's I, I didn't know that where the different uh, denominations perhaps relate to different waves of immigration. I think that's probably a unique aspect of the history that many people don't know yeah. of North America, where there are these strong ties, of course, to Europe, but also the church landscape today is very much based on that, those immigration patterns. I imagine with, uh, I know a little bit of the Lutheran history where depending on where like the Norwegians and the Swedes right. and the Germans, they had different ways, which roughly corresponds to different denominations. But here right. it sounds rather than different parts of the Netherlands, different time frames, perhaps, and their ties to churches in the, in yeah, the Netherlands. Different times immigrating over bringing different controversies and emphases from right. the Netherlands, like the Canadian reformed, which are about 50 to 80 churches, which we're talking small groups, yeah. there's not many Dutch reformed people, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but they immigrated over mostly in the fifties and sixties. Mm. And they generally stuck those immigrants stuck together, didn't find a home in the Christian reformed church. And so stuck it out independently. Um, you know, yeah, they, in a way, in some churches, they've shaken off a lot of their Dutch ancestry. And so mm -hmm. what happens in the Netherlands doesn't matter as much. Right. And they've nativized, if you will, which I think is ultimately the fate of the churches. And mm -hmm. I think it's ultimately a good thing. Right. But there are others that are more connected with what's going back on in the Netherlands and the controversies there. They have sister churches there, They, you know, things like that. So it all depends. It's a diverse group of people for how small it is. Right. And that, thank you for explaining that. And yeah, that's there's a lot more, but yeah, yeah. And we, that, that would be a, a whole show, perhaps working through all those uh, different groups. And I know to some degree that they, certain ones will work together with other ones. And we, yeah. I, you shared with me in the past how two, two groups were quite close to getting together and there was a bit of a, a yes. doctrinal or perhaps personality disagreements, which get in the way of that and that that's a reality in in a lot of different traditions where right. there are smaller things keep us apart we know for anglicans and lutherans they'll have similar issues so right. thank you for explaining that that really helps set the scene and i think a lot of people today might get a better idea when someone says they might need hey i'm reformed or dutch reformed right. they they can probably piece together who they are about and and all that sort of stuff so why don't we now take that uh, we we have an idea about the denominations, and it seems like you're rooted in the UR, URC, United yes, Reformed Church, and you have some experience with the CRC, where you're currently working 
alongside in your, your current internship. So why don't you just talk a little bit about what life is actually like in a Dutch Reformed church? And that, that's something where I imagine uh, as people who talk about being Protestants and uh, share a love of the scripture, a lot of things will be uh, perhaps similar. I think we, we both mm-hmm. would expect longer sermons than our Anglican or Roman Catholic friends would get at one of their uh, chapels or uh, services. But mm-hmm. there are also some critical differences when it comes to, I think a lot of Baptists, if they were to go to perhaps a, a traditional URC service, they would have uh, they'd be maybe pretty shocked unless they came from a certain kind of Baptist church. So mm-hmm. within each group, there are, there is diversity and maybe they correspond at different levels. But why don't you just walk us through? Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit about, I don't know if there would be much difference between a URC and a CRC service, but uh, I'll let you. There would be. There would be. Um, okay. So why, why don't you tell us a bit about the URC first, since that's where you're rooted? Sure. Mm-hmm. So the URC would, um, the average... Do you want to hear first about how a Sunday service would go or like yeah, so, what church life is? Like? So w- why don't you walk us through a normal Sunday service? What would you see if I were to visit on a Sunday morning? What would I see? Sure. So it would be very similar, I think, to a traditional Baptist mm. service. Um, you'd walk in, you'd find your seat after often there'd be a greeter. Um, I'd listening to music as the service begins. Um, the minister would walk down the aisle, shake hands with the elders who would take their seats and he would start. And in your service, you'll hear a call to worship. Mm-hmm. So a section of a Psalm would be sung, uh, would be said that would call the people of God to worship sort of starting off the service. Um, maybe uh, a greeting from one of Paul's letters would then be read out like grace to you from God, our father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. There would be song singing. Now in the URC, we've retained the tradition of singing Psalms, right. not exclusively, but um, the 150 Psalms are to take precedence in worship. And I'm very glad for that. Yeah. Um, you will have corporate confession. So um, a call to repentance would be given uh, the law would be read in a traditional URC. You would have the entire Ten Commandments read out verbatim or some something similar to that. And then there would be prayer led by the minister and then either an absolution afterwards where the, our sins are announced to be forgiven or um, something like that. Afterwards, there would be more singing. Um, there would be a sermon. Roughly between maybe 30 minutes to 45 minutes at the latest. Yeah. So sort of like a Baptist service in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, You would have the sacraments. um, You would have congregational prayer. And then it would close out with a benediction and with a blessing. Right. Um, The average Sunday, you'll have two services. Mm -hmm. And in the URC uh, and more, I suppose, traditional Dutch Reformed churches, you, you are expected at both. They are not the same service. There is one in the morning or and then one in the afternoon or evening. Right. And you're there for both. So you might go to the first service, have coffee afterwards, be invited over to someone's place for lunch, have lunch, eat cake, have coffee there again, then come back for the second service in the afternoon or maybe for the evening. Um, very much the same in the evening service, except often the sermon won't be now, I have to be careful when I say this. The sermon won't be on the Bible. Oh. It will be on the catechism. Okay. Now, I should explain what that means. Please. That does not mean, well, when it's done well, it does not mean that you open up to the catechism and you read it and say, thus saith the Lord, mm-hmm. and then you close it and exposit it. Some will read it and sort of walk through what it says, expositing. But what it means is that the catechism is divided into 52 Sundays. And so you work through each Sunday. And the idea is that by the end of the year, you have worked through the gospel, the law of God, uh, the Ten Command- so the Ten Commandments, mm-hmm. uh, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed. You'll work through it all in the evening service topically, using the catechism as a guide. Right. So, it's doct- so it's more of a doctrinal sermon, if you will, topical for the evening. Yeah. And then in the evening service, you will have either it will be sung or recited the Apostles' Creed, maybe the Nicene. Mm. So 
there's liturgical elements in it. Um, but it would be more like a Presbyterian service than an Anglican service. Right. Now, if you are in a more contemporary Dutch Reformed church, psalm singing might not be present. Instead, you might have more of a contemporary style of worship. Your church might use a lectionary, like the Revised Common Lectionary. Your sermons might be a bit shorter. Um, you might have things like a children's message, things right. like that. Hmm. Um, I'm sure you, your listeners know kind of the difference between um, contemporary worship and traditional worship. Yeah. We have that conflict as well. Hmm. Um, yeah, and, and in a more contemporary Dutch Reformed Church, you might not have a second service, or it might not be an expected thing for you to be present for. Hmm. Right. So no. in the main, mm -hmm. that is what a Dutch Reform Sunday looks like. And, and that, that's very helpful. And I, I, can, I have two comments in response. First, that's something I really admire about your tradition and just hearing it now, how much scripture is present in that service from the very beginning to, to the end. That's right. something I, I really appreciate. That's something I, I love to see and hear about. I know people are getting the word and that, that's a firm foundation. And that, another thing, I, I love the idea of uh, the two services. I know uh, a lot of people. So my church, we do our small group Sunday evening, I think with a similar right. spirit of being with the people of God on the Lord's day, but I love the idea of the service. And of course, that the other comment is a lot of parallels with certain Baptist circles where some traditional Baptist churches, you're still having the two services with fellowship with believers mm -hmm. in between. And uh, I visit, I, I'm not part of a confessionally reformed Baptist church. We lean in a Calvinistic way, but I okay. visited confessionally reformed Baptist churches. And it's very much similar to what you described with mm -hmm. the, the call to worship and the absolution being right. read out and the benediction at the end. So uh, my, if, in the main, the service yeah. is the same, I would say. In right. The main. Um, in the main. Yeah. Unique and very unique would be the usage of the catechism right liturgically in the evening services yeah so and, and that that's why i wanted to maybe before getting into life outside of the sunday morning for a rapid fire near the end but uh sure. just briefly the catechism at the end uh would you say that is that that's perhaps an interesting place where something i've been wondering about and i've seen people in our, my circles posting about this is that mostly where people will get their understanding of what it means to be a christian in terms of doctrine where the morning from scripture, that's more about the Christian walk and perhaps um, not moral teaching, but more driven for living out what scripture teaches while the evening from the mm. catechism, that's where people, we're going to talk about the, the doctrine of God today. We're going to talk about what is required of you in the, the sixth commandment. So is that is that sort of the impulse there? Right. Morning, it's more to perhaps the heart and the walk and the evening is more, let's actually inform you of what the faith is about and what you must believe right. sort of thing i would seriously hope not and okay. i haven't experienced that as i mentioned the catechism is written with uh, the language of we and i right it is heartfelt and its contents really are about the personal experiential part of the faith mm. um so i would hope it's not just dry preaching of like this is the list of sins that the sixth commandment forbids and this is the list of duties the sixth commandments forbid amen right. um it is not supposed to be that way in the morning you will generally have an expository sermon so okay. you'll work through a text um most conservative reformed dutch reformed churches will not use a lectionary they'll just work through a book so like they'll go through romans they'll go through galatians something like that um, and then the catechism they'll go through. And so it will be topical in the evening. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think it's actually quite good because you never have the debate over topical versus expository preaching because you're doing the same thing. <laughs> right. So you really can't trash either because you're doing both. You're doing both. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not segregated that way. Um, right. It could be, I suppose. But I think that would be an injustice because you should be able to preach doctrinally from the Bible itself, and you should be able to take maybe the more abstract truths and make them experiential in the evenings. Right, um, and 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 that that's helpful. I'm glad you said it. Where it definitely is still preaching. It's not it's not a seminary class in the evening yeah. with a systematic from hey yeah. we're using that. So yeah. so it still will be a sermon meant to feed God's people. So so that's helpful and. It, right. it truly is. And that's a funny way of putting it where there often are 
the worship debates are probably something churches are more familiar with, but seminary students are familiar with the expository yeah. versus topical. Maybe that's yeah. more heated and yeah, definitely for Baptists who, who have an appreciation for Spurgeon, but would never preach like him themselves. That's something we can, we can appreciate. And yeah, uh, is... if Dr. Reed ever listens to this, I'll, I'll mention that. I love <laughs> Dr. Reed's preaching class. That was beautiful. I, I loved it as well. Yeah. And it gave me a good foundation that I'm very much appreciating this summer. Yeah. Oh, so that that's good. And, and that's something uh, for those who don't know, Alexander is a first rate preacher. And it's not just that he's well dressed as our friend David would uh, <laughs> would love, yes, to, David love to comment on. Yeah. I wear a tie for David now. Yeah, no, that that's good. <laughs> Dave, David keeps us looking sharp. So may, mm-hmm. maybe now just to end it off before we, we get so, to some concluding thoughts, I, I'd like to hear sure. maybe just a couple questions, brief uh, things that go on outside of the Sunday morning. That's something we love to emphasize mm-hmm. for for us, church isn't just the the Lord's Day corporate worship service in the morning. As you said, it's already you have an evening service, which is great. Yep. But uh, often. what else? Often, often okay. that is the traditional practice. Right, right. So, and again, that's there is some diversity. So maybe reflecting on your experience, and maybe the churches around you, maybe there's a bit of a a circle or a theological culture here. Would you have a weekly prayer meeting or service or anything like that, like during the week? So a weekly prayer meeting, um, it depends on the church, okay. these things, um, things like that, things like Bible studies, things, mm. groups like that, they, they absolutely exist. I'm a part of men's Bible study in my home church. Okay. Um, the church that I'm serving out here has a prayer team that they meet every Tuesday, um, every other Tuesday. So it depends from like church to church. My experience has been Bible studies are big youth groups are big um sort of more word-centered ministries like that are big Mm. vbs is during the summer kind of all the things that maybe evangelicals might do right there's a big influence from what what they do we also often tend to do because if it's a good idea it's a good idea Mm -hmm. yeah so so now now i'm thinking that that's interesting so that that might be a a bit a place where initially baptists were very much looking to the dutch reformed and other reformed churches for influence but maybe that's a place where there's been some returning the favor Mm -hmm. so you know go ahead yep in the um, in the immigrations Mm -hmm. like full disclosure i'm not dutch at all i'm scottish yeah um in the immigration when you have it when you already have the presbyterians in north america when you immigrate over, you either double down on the Dutchiness, mm-hmm. which I don't think anyone wants to do, or you take the influences you get because you're a minority. And in Canada, it's different because there are not many Presbyterians and conservative reformed evangelicals are Dutch reform. In the States, it's the reverse. Definitely more Presbyterians than there are uh, Dutch reform. So the influences are different there. Right. Um, but you're a minority in a predominantly English Baptist, Congregationalist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Methodist kind of, you know, sphere. Yeah. You're going to take all the influences you can get there. Mm, interesting. And that, that again, is a, a complex but rich history that uh, it, it's wonderful to hear about and get to know. So may, maybe you, you highlighted it a bit and maybe you're the perfect person to ask who's not Dutch, but in a largely Dutch world. And uh, I hate to do this, but there is a common saying. I've seen it plenty of times. I haven't heard it in person, but uh, there's the classic, uh, if if you're not, not Dutch, you ain't much or something. Much. Yeah. So, so and and of course, every tradition denomination, they have some things that they're, they're working on. Hey, we know this is a problem, but it would seem as an outsider that there has been a bit of a struggle in terms of how much does the reformed part relate to the Dutch part. And mm. uh, perhaps may, maybe, I, I don't know. And of course, it, this is a sensitive topic and a lot of people have different opinions, not trying to be controversial, but uh, you're, you're Scottish in a Dutch reformed world and maybe there's some tension, but I would imagine people who maybe are clearly not visible Dutch or yep. uh, frankly, I'll just speak bluntly, who are not white might be feeling <laughs> like there might be some tension there or a little concern. Uh, any comments or thoughts on that? What have you seen? Are Dutch Reformed churches trying to change or has there been resistance? Sure. Is that a, an issue? Yeah. So as I said, there is not a church that calls themselves Dutch Reformed. Right. Um, that is the ethnic name. It's not codified. It's not part of anything. Mm. It's 
a matter of history and a matter matter of Dutch people being the majority right. of people in Dutch Reformed churches. Um, so it's not, we're not kinists. Mm-hmm. We're not, there's no, like, uh, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. That's not, that's not a doctrinal point. Yes. That's um, maybe just a sentiment or a joke. Um, I have not experienced racism. Mm-hmm. Um, I would hope and I would pray that um, African Americans, Asian Americans, that they would feel as welcome in our churches as they would anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Because they're also made in the image of God and they also have souls that need saving. Right. Um, because we, because the tradition is an immigrant tradition, just like with Korean Presbyterians, right. you have a predominant ethnicity and originally a, a predominant language that forced maybe a segregation. Yeah. And as you come into your own after a few, a couple generations of living in an English um, multi-ethnic culture or cultural sphere, you have to make that choice. Are you going to double down on your ethnicity, uh, like that segregation kind of mindset, or are you going to first say i am a church of christ in this country by providence so i am going to minister to my neighbors no matter who they are and i'm going to use the common language because that honors god i would say in the main we've done that Mm -hmm. all all the churches have done that maybe some have been aggressive in rejecting the dutchness the culture aspect Uh, maybe others I can think of that do not even have services in English have definitely gone in the reverse direction, but they're a very small minority. Um, so I can't really answer that question because I am, I am white. So I wouldn't know necessarily what it would mean to be a black person facing discrimination, in a majority white church, but I would hope and pray that that would not be the case and that the efforts that have been made and the efforts that are continuing to be made, would continue to bear fruit Mm -hmm. i know amongst ministers i know of a korean dutch reform pastor Mm -hmm. and a mexican dutch reform pastor in ontario wow i know one from guyana nice um like i'm not trying to be like tokenism i'm not trying to cite that but as yeah i mean i i don't believe that's born we've borne that fruit of racism in a long time. Mm. There's one dark stain in our tradition, which is apartheid Mm. because in South Africa, um, the Boer people, which are really the Africanized Dutch people um, were mostly reformed. And they, there is still a couple of churches that officially embrace apartheid as a doctrinal point. Mm. Right. That is a bit of a dark stain on the international tradition. Um, and that's for them to deal with. Right. But thankfully, North America, that's been avoided. Mm, that, I'd like to see in the main. And, and, and that, that's good to hear. I think you said, uh, I'll, I'll just say a, a few things that I think are worth repeating so people hear that. I love that. We're, we're speaking about the Dutch Reformed tradition. But as you said, that's a historical uh, claim, speaking about the history and, of course, the majority. But as you think about it, quite intentionally, I, I would imagine you, you speak of the CRC Christian Reformed churches and the United Reformed Churches, Dutch isn't in the name, unlike some other denominations who do have Dutch in the name. Uh, it seems like the major bodies, I know you mentioned there's a Netherlands Reformed Church, which yep. is probably about the origins more so than anything else. But uh, that that's an interesting point. It's, no, it's not codified anywhere. And as you say, like we have today now where there are plenty of Persian churches or uh, right. various African congregations, language is a huge deal. And yep. uh, if you're fresh fresh off the boat to use the saying, and you're only speaking Dutch, of course, you're going to have a Dutch congregation who can praise God in the language they know. And I think as people think about that and might see churches that are all one tone and uh, ethnicity kind of thing, think about that history and realize how language and immigration plays a part in that where uh, there there probably were a few bad apples in the bunch. And that's everywhere, of course. But thinking about it, there are some pretty logical Mm. and reasonable reasons for churches to gather in the ways they gather. And as you say, different churches today are taking different directions. And of course, uh, uh, with uh, South Africa and apartheid, of course, I'm a Baptist and Baptist globally speaking, we have to wrestle with 
certain groups have done certain things we we don't appreciate and that is up to them as yeah. you say to I, i'm not going to go over there and whack them with a spoon they have to work through these things and they answer to god for those things and yep. we we could talk about more things and different things but i think people here have a lot to grapple with and any longer may, maybe already this is a two-part i don't know but that's because this is interesting stuff and I hope people appreciate that. So Alexander, thank you for sharing all that you shared. A lot of these questions, I, I sent to Alexander some of the main themes I wanted to get, but this has been, people have been watching a truly back and forth conversation and Alexander has been so gracious and sharing. So as we close out now, I want to leave it to you, Alexander, to just one final thought or encouragement off the top of your head. I didn't tell you this so that you would have to, what What's the first thing that comes to your mind as an encouragement to my audience today? Maybe it's a, a recommended book or a suggestion or uh, some sort of reflection, anything you have that you would just want to leave the people with. A book or a reflection or now I'm thinking of a book. Okay. Um, but I can't think of one. You know, I will recommend the Heidelberg Catechism. I've mentioned it a few times, but it really is the heart and soul of the tradition of the Reformed churches. Right. Um, beyond culture, beyond, you know, whatever, it is, it is the ideal for what we're striving for in our thinking, our Christian life, um, and everything. So I would recommend that. Nice. And, and that, of course, I will have, please, now that Alexander said it, I'll have the link down below, check it out. And it's worth, I think it's, such a wonderful book. It's worth getting a physical copy where that's classic after church, Sunday afternoon kind of reading. I think you're sitting down with a tea or a coffee. That's the kind of book that you want to work mm-hmm. through on a Sunday, I think. So Alexander, again, thank you so much for being so gracious and spending time with us. I think you're a wonderful, you were saying this is your first interview. I think you were wonderful. I think the people appreciate it. And if people do have questions, there's a lot we could talk about, a lot of history and theology please leave them in the comments down below. Alexander and I talk, and I'm sure if you have any questions, we'll, we'll see them and I'll make sure Alexander can respond to them. Or, and I know we, a lot of our friends watching on discord might have questions. So I believe the conversation will continue, but that's it for now. I hope that everyone enjoyed. And if you want to see more of Alexander, let me know. I would love to have him. I'm going to have him back on either way. And I've said that. So now, it's, now it has go. to happen. But I'll hold uh, you to account for that. Yeah. And if there are any topics people are interested, let me know down below. If it's for Alexander question, make sure to, to make sure it's a hard one. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, otherwise, <laughs> thanks everyone for watching. That's it for now. I will catch you next time here on Christian's Colloquy. Take care. <laughs>